The misconceptions and debate around feminism and its origin have been in existence for as long as we can remember. Questions such as, is feminism African, have oftentimes surfaced in discussions, and providing robust and detailed illustrations on how women fought relentlessly for their rights, going back to history, has always left an impression on the faces of many who believed contrary. This documentary was produced by the Nigerian Feminist Forum and funded by African Women Development Fund. I am Aisha Imam. I'm a feminist. No ifs, no buts. I am a feminist. No if, no buts. I have no apology about it. So I am a feminist. Simple. My name is Amy Imonuera. Oyekunle. I am an African feminist. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. My name is Leslie Agams and I'm a feminist. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. I'm Zina Mohammed. I am a feminist. No if, no buts. My name is Charmaine Pereira. I am a feminist. No ifs, no buts. My name is Ada Agena Ude. I'm a feminist. No ifs, no buts. My name is Kiki Morgi, and I'm a feminist. No buts, no ifs, no maybe. My name is Ihoma Obibi. I'm a Nigerian feminist. No ifs, no buts, and no maybes. My name is Solon Fechi Odinkalu, and I am a feminist. No ifs, no buts, no maybe. Well, um, it started when I was a little, little girl, I suppose. Yeah, I wouldn't have called it feminism then, but um, just a sense of when my parents migrated, you know, my story is probably a little bit different from others, but my parents, we migrated, my sister and I and my parents, um, from Kenya to Brazil. I was 13 at the time, and it was in that movement that in, and in a new situation um, where I now saw that my father was the one who had uh, my mum and my sister and I now looking after all the needs in the house. Whereas previously in Kenya, as was the case with most middle class families, you would have had um, uh, maids, um, or people who would do the domestic work. So now it seemed to me like my father had three maids and we were the ones doing all that work. So for me, it started as a very young child becoming aware first of class differences, what I could do and what my playmates in the compound could not do because their parents were not wealthy enough to send them to school. And gender differences, what girls were allowed to do, what boys were allowed to do. Yes. And then later, as an undergraduate student in the UK, becoming aware of race differences, how black people were treated and white people were treated. Um, and I became involved in uh, black politics, gender politics, race politics, but none of them were, none of them spoke to all facets of my identity. So when, we, when I came back to Nigeria to do my youth service, I was part of a group that mm -hmm. formed Women in Nigeria, which I think was the first feminist women's organization. Mm -hmm. And we were clear that women were marginalized as gender group and oppressed as in different ways of members of class groups. Mm -hmm. And that Nigeria, Africa in general, was in a difficult position because of colonialism and neo-colonialism, and we thought that all three needed to be addressed together. Okay. Um, later, when I became involved in the African Feminist Forum, I was actually one of the part of the working group that produced the charter, and we wanted to have a charter that spoke to us as African feminists. Uh, it started for me by reading the first time 
even though before I started reading, I stumbled into feminist books or books written by feminists. I had that inclination. Uh, personally, I ask a, a lot of questions in my private moment. I like to, my nature is such that uh, I stay with myself a lot. So when I am with myself, I ask myself many questions. And uh, I go deep down to get the answers. So in the process, I became aware of the difference between the situations of men and women, boys and girls. But it's not something I gave a name until much later. I came from an already uh, fried environment. My parents were divorced. It was a very acrimonious divorce. Uh, there was a lot of domestic violence um, to the extent that my mom's dad decided, you know what, I'm not, I'm, this is not happening. So I already knew that there was a particular way I didn't want to be treated as a young woman, but also as a young woman uh, that had the potential to be married, should I decide I wanted to be married? But it, it was very, because I'm an academic person, understanding the nuances of feminism was very straightforward for me because it was easy to imbibe and it was easy to put it into my life. Now, remember, I came to feminism 16, I was 16, 17. I think when I read Maya Angelou's book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. How old was I, 17 or 18? By the time I was e reading Andrea Lord, I was going into doing my A-levels, I think. And by the time I was reading other African-American authors on what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a black woman, and then in my case, what it means to be the daughter of an immigrant in 80s London, living in Hackney, a dump. For so it was very straightforward, but it was very hard because what my mother did was to hold on to those cultural values, whether good or bad, and cocooned her children in them. So whilst it was very easy, it was very ideas that I was having that she couldn't understand. You know, I remember when I got to a particular age, all of a sudden she was championing her friends that had sons. Some of them couldn't string a sentence in English together, but she thought, oh, I needed to be married ASAP. And I couldn't understand what she was talking about because I lived in England and I didn't see. And so she had a parade of young men that she thought I should get married to. Okay, this one, what do you think of him? I had every single one of them, their hair, their legs, the way they spoke English. I remember one telling me, I could, I, you know, you're too intellectual. Every time, you're always reading, always reading. Uh, you find something to do, you know? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm reading, but he didn't appreciate reading. So that was it. So in terms of the journey, it was actually quite straightforward for me. But... It was culturally very difficult. I think for me, it was a nomenclature that I needed to plug in. For me, I think my growing up and the way I was brought up tilted me towards feminism. Although there was no name attached to it at that time. It was just something we did naturally because we saw our grandmothers, our mothers doing it. I come from a line of very strong women and I'll be sharing some later on. Okay. Very strong okay. women, women who made us realize very early in life that we were not inferior to anybody. It was our lived reality. Women who provided an umbrella for other women in the search for equality, equity, and justice. So I grew up with two very strong grandmothers who brought up their daughter. My, grand, my, my paternal grandmother didn't have a girl, so I was the first girl. And so she poured that into me. 
Um, I think I'm going to have to tell, I'd, I'd, I'd like to tell a story. Um, I, I was called a feminist for a very long time before I actually called myself a feminist. For a very long time, when people called me a feminist, I was in my 20s, I was very young, I would actually argue, say, no, I'm not a feminist, because I had all those stereotypical beliefs about feminism, just like everybody else, you know, that they have men haters and bra burners and all sorts of, all those stereotypes. And then, um, I remember specifically, it was in the year 2000, and this was also when the internet came into Nigeria. I decided to look up what is feminism. And that was when I found out that feminism is a theoretical system. I found that there are many branches of feminism. I found out that also feminism is a fight for an activist, activism for women's equality. And having educated myself and learned that, I delved into feminism. I met my African sisters. One of my first mentors was uh, Dr. Rose Achilono. She was a professor with Imo State University. She, she's late now. She was an early feminist. And the feminists of the 90s also had very different ideas about, Nigerian feminists of 90s had a very different idea of feminism. And then I attended my first African feminist forum, which was in 2006 in Accra. And that was when I came, that was when the African Feminist Charter was being written. I think I would say the origin of feminism for me began <laughs> even as a child. I remember thinking it was not right that women and girls were restricted to do certain roles, to um, certain spaces and certain corners in their homes. I remember thinking that it was unfair that women carried the burden of unpaid care work and yet were not involved, included in decision-making platforms. I was incensed that women were told what to wear, what to dress, who to marry, when to marry, and how many children they should have. And so from a very young age, I questioned many of those uh, traditions and roles and cultures. Um, the schools didn't tell me what I wanted to hear and I refused to accept it. I came late um, to the table. You know, people talk about feminism, being a feminist and all that. Um, for me, I didn't even know anything about it until um, around May, I think May 2007, um, I've been in denial for a long time about so many things in my life and uh, always believing that I needed approval um, for me to be able to do some basic things in my life. So around 2007, I met with wonderful people who talked about feminism, who talked about um, being a woman, you have to have value and all that. And I, and I was like, Wow. So this is what I've been missing all my life. So for me, it started like that. It started by listening to people. Um, my journey with feminism started as a young age because, um, again, as people say, the personal is political. I started out identifying as a feminist after being confronted with um, patriarchal values that were forced upon me from family, from religion, from the society I grew up in. Um, I was raised Muslim, so I was expected to grow up with a certain amount of decency, which meant control, basically, of my body, depending on the way that the men in my family or the men in the society thought um, was uh, useful for them. I was expected from a very young age to cover all the way from my head to my eyes, and not be um, heard, only be seen when spoken to, and to follow the doctrines in which um, women were raised. And it was completely different for those who were male in my family. So I started to push back very early, and it took me a while. I think I was about uh, 14, 15, when somebody asked me if I was a feminist. And I said, no, of course I'm not a feminist. 
At that point, I had no idea what it meant. And then later on, I asked somebody else what a feminist meant, and she told me what feminism was. And I was like, oh yeah, surely, I definitely am a feminist. And it took me a while trying to find the person I had told that I wasn't a feminist to remind her and reaffirm, even from that age, that I understood what feminism was and that I identified as a feminist and I believed in the goals that feminism held firm. Actually, I would define my journey as a feminist as something that happened quite naturally. I, I was brought up uh, by a mom that did not segregate duties uh she she shared chores according to your age and not according to the sex so and she also shared chores according to your interest so you know from when i was little i would wash cars you know while some of my brothers could be in the kitchen and so for me uh inequality, you know, or unequalness uh, among, among siblings, for instance, was never a thing until I actually, I didn't really understand this until I got to, say, secondary school, uh, you know, when I had, you know, friends talk about how they were being treated, and then more glaringly in university. Uh, you know, when I, because I went to an all girls secondary school. And one thing I've also noticed speaking to some of my other friends uh, that are feminist is that for those of us that went to an all girls school, we, 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 we didn't have this challenge of feeling unequal with, with um, male students because we were all girls. And that helped us when we were in university. I did not struggle into, into feminism, into feminist thought because of the way that I had been brought up. So I, I lived in Lagos um, and I, I just remember feeling that it was unfair that there were things that boys and men got to do and ways that they got to be and present themselves that didn't feel accessible to girls and women. Um, I, I would you know, my, my, my cousins and I would be told to help in the kitchen where boys would continue playing whatever games we'd all been mutually playing. So things like that. So I, I felt, I didn't only feel like a sense of unfairness and injustice, but I felt really strongly like a kind of a, a mini existential crisis that, that a four or five year old can have. Um, and Thereafter, I'd say that my feminist journey has really gone in, in waves, much like the feminist movement itself. So I've had like a first wave of, of Mina Salami becoming a feminist and a second wave and a third wave. Um, so if, if that's my first wave, as a fourth, the second wave was when I was a teenager, I was probably about 15 or 16, and I read a book by Toni Morrison called Sula. And when I read that book, I just felt that this was a new world for me. It was life-changing. So the story for me and how it all started for me, it's from, it's from a personal angle of coming to the realization of who I am. And it is about accepting myself first as a queer person and having to grow up in a society where I found myself to be different than a lot of women. And having suffered and struggled to conform and not to conform to a societal expectations of what being a woman should be. I had so many conflicts and I fought within myself and to the point until I, I, um, I came to self-realization that I am who I am. Well, I started off with feminism as a Marxist when I was in the university. Uh, I was part of the Marxist bloc in the university. And um, I noticed that there were a lot of um, a male dominance uh, in the movement. Uh, in that movement, there were about 12 or more people, and there were just about two or three women you know, within the movement. And we realized that the discussion at the movement at that level were not uh, dovetailing to issues that really you know, concerned us then you know, as young women who were just growing up within the university. Um, so we started reading um, Marxism to see how 
Magazine frame conversations around women, you know, and girls. So one of the things that first caught my attention was the intervention by a Marxist called Rosa Dusenburg. Uh, so we started reading about uh, our writings uh, in the Marxist blog and the theory and the principle. So that was how I started off, you know, looking at. So I started as a uh, feminist Marxist. So meaning that. I was looking at uh, the political economy of every nation, uh, looking at how capitalism, you know, uh, has contributed to uh, male dominance, and how and how that has further expanded gender inequality, you know, uh, in the country and also globally. I grew up in a home of really strong women. My mom, my grandmother, my sisters. These are amazing women who were strong, and that's the only way I can describe them. And I know strong encompasses a lot of things, but you know, for my grandmother, she's a person who would stand up for the family. For example, she's a person who would find a snake outside her compound and run to get a knife and chop off the head. I always found it so fascinating, like what kind of woman is this? And then my mother is a person who would fight for you and believe you as her child, no matter what. She just wants you to tell her exactly what happens and she'll be there to defend you. So I remember the first time someone called me a feminist. I was very heated. I was mad. I wasn't even sure what being a feminist meant, but it's the way that he said it. It was so insulting. And so I didn't like that. But, you know, subsequently, I had people call me feminist and I was like, okay, what is a feminist? And I went in and I discovered this amazing world of this history of women who had done amazing things, the things that I wish, you know, I could do in my lifetime. And I started to understand why people, you know, would see me as a feminist, because I would always have the woman agenda in every conversation. And that was when I decided, OK, maybe I was a feminist. <laughs> Okay, for me, um, feminism means the liberation of women. So, um, in different contexts, the systems, the structures that um, oppress women vary. And even within the same country in Nigeria, that is the case. But it, for me, it's about um, an intellectual as well as a political project to um, unravel those structures. So by intellectual, I mean understanding the different sources of that oppression. Patriarchy, class, race, ethnicity, religion, generation, all of those. How do they work for different groups of women? You know, how do they have their effects? And then the political part is how do we organize to try and change that? And that's organizing with other feminists and at times, uh, depending on the issue or the situation, organizing with other progressive social movements and groups. I think that's what I'm saying. I think once before the feminist charter came along, I was, a, I was the youngest member of a, a, a feminist organization in the UK called um, Af Akina Mamawa Africa. And it was an organization that allowed me to really understand some of my concerns. It was also very therapeutic to be a member of that organization. And it wasn't just that organization I was a member of. The space that gave me the room to grow was Akina Mamawa Africa. Um, they used to be based in the UK. They're now based, their head office is now in Kampala, Uganda. And it allowed me to be an African young girl finding her way and her voice in England. And if we had a voice, our voice was spoken by the people that came to help us, our white middle-class sisters. So it was a space that allowed me to have voice. And so by the time the charter came along, I was already sold because I understood the charter. It was very easy to imbibe the beliefs, you know, be kind, understand their needs, their wants, 
understand that some of my best friends were from within that community. Um, and some were self-identifying, some were not. Then to understand, and because I also came from a, a, a family home that was, I mean, my family home was really, really dramatic. Um, um, and so I understood how important it was for me to have my voice. Once the charter came along, it made it even easier for me to negotiate my marriage, negotiate the space within that marriage, but also negotiate there were bones of contention. Uh, and so it was easy to do, but hard, because you're constantly adjusting to find a way to work things out without upsetting the upper cart. So I remember the first time that I came across the uh, Charter of African Feminist Principles, and I, I guess the best way I can describe it was just, um, for me, it was really affirming. It made me feel a lot less lonely in the world. Um, at this point, I had uh, I'd, I'd studied a lot of Black and African diaspora feminist rights which was where I grew up and where my feminism was rooted. Uh, and so coming across the, the chart of African feminist principles, which I can't remember exactly where I did that, but it was just a, a, a kind of a mind blowing um, event. I don't know since, you know, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a document that I go back and read, you know, every day or even every year necessarily, but I, could, I, I would say that the, it's a kind of blueprint um, you know, I share it as frequently as I can, um, and I'm, I kind of know the content of it. You know, I'm always aware of this charter's existence and how relevant it is. It's also one of the most radical feminist documents that I think exists not only in Africa, but in the world. Feminism, to me, I think one of the easiest ways I can define it is the refusal to discriminate based on a person's sex or gender. Um, if you refuse to treat people differently based on their assigned sex or gender, um, I believe that you are a feminist. If you believe that everyone deserves rights to be treated with equality, with justice, with care, um, regardless of what they identify as or what society sees them as, then I believe that that is um, feminism. Um, the way that the NFF Charter has affected the way I see feminism and the way I associate with other people who identify as feminists is, I, I believe that it's a good guiding document. Um, it's one of the few documents about feminism on the continent that spells very clearly what it stands for and what it doesn't stand for. I remember during the Abuja Feminist Forum days, 2012, 2013, thereabouts, when we used to have um, meetings often, um, there was a pushback then from some people who identify it as, as feminists about LGBT rights within the movement. And um, I remember, I think it was Leslie Agams who pushed back very firmly as to what the NFF stood for and asked if people had actually read the charter. This forced people to confront um, what the, the biases that they held. Um, the stand of the Nigerian Feminist Forum, its charters, its, its principles, and to ask themselves if they clearly were feminist and if they were standing for everyone regardless of uh, their social class, their sexual orientation, gender identity, or they were just women's rights activists? Um, I think to me, feminism just means being able to express myself how I want, whenever I want, without having to be questioned by others and um, or told that what I'm doing is wrong, essentially. Um, and I feel like that, extends to both myself and the women in my immediate circles as well and I because I just a lot of what they still um even like even though it was more so in the past still today there are a lot of things that regulate how women and young girls behave and when a woman try to do things that are out of the norm or quote unquote abnormal context so like to just experiment and 
that provides an avenue for me to do that and also gives me the confidence to do it as well. Well, I think there are some that are um, much better known than others. So uh, in the north, Nana Asmao, um, for example, at the time of the jihad, the Soviet jihad, um, she is well known for her writing, for her work on um, uh, getting girls, trying to push for girls and women's education, which uh, in Islam is supposed to be um, uh, championed, but at the time that was not the case. So um, she made her mark in those fears. And then she was a very prolific writer and in using different forms, poetry, um, uh, other more um, narrative forms. And she wrote in different languages, Hausa, Fulfuli, uh, and left quite a body of work. Um, there have been, um, well, um, Professor Bolani Awe has edited a book which has um, uh, histor historians <clears throat> um, documenting the contributions of different women from Nigeria d at different points in time and, and you know, the uh, contributions they've made. Closer to the contemporary period, there all were all the, all the women involved in struggles against um, the colonial structures. So whether that's um, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti um, <clears throat> in the southwest, Gambosa Waba in the north, Margaret Ekpo, and the, um, the women who were very active in the 1929 Women's War in the east. <clears throat> there have been lots of women apart from the famous names. You know, we know of the names of certain individual women, but there are lots of others whose names are not known, but without whom those struggles would not have been carried out and they would not have um, made the gains that they did. Apart from getting um, the colonialist uh, native administration system overturned, at that time, the women also struggled for the franchise. And in Nigeria, it was won at different times in the North and in the South. So, you know, there's, there's a lot there in the history. I'm not a historian, but um, a fair amount has been documented. And I think there's a lot more that is not yet documented. Some of the leading figures of Nigerian feminism long before it became called feminism, when it was called the Nigerian mo women's movement, and who don't nearly get named enough, people like Professor Rosa Chilonu, who was a professor at Imo State University, and she wrote one of the earliest feminist texts that I read in Nigeria. She wrote it back in the 80s, and she was a personal mentor. There was also uh, Helen, Mwachiku, who was a professor at the University of uh, Port Harcourt, who also, um, they tried to define feminism, they tried really hard to define a feminism that reflected who they were. Now, they had issues with feminism at that time, um, and it caused quite a bit of a, a schism between them and, let's say, Western feminists had to do around family values, and what were the African, uh, the family values of, of the African woman. They borrowed heavily from Maya Angelou's definition of womanism, where they tried to describe what was for us a homegrown kind of feminism. And, but back then, it was a Nigerian feminist movement. Margaret Ibu never called herself a feminist. Um, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti never called herself a feminist. It wasn't until Women in Nigeria was inaugurated in the 80s that they specifically came together to define a feminism that was inclusive, all inclusive, because many of our early feminists, due to their own traditional values or their own conservative values, were not able to 
accept the feminism as it was being defined by the West. Okay, I think I'm not as old as I should be to know all of the women. Uh, Margaret Epo, Fumi, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti, and a number of others. But even in our lifetime, there are sisters in the movements that have done exceptionally well and that have moved the movement forward in different spheres. So you have Ada Agina Ude, close to the and most likely member of WIN, Women in Nigeria. Um, you have a number of other sisters, Dr. Aisha Iman. Dr. Professor Amina Mama. Um, a lot of these women are alive and well in the academic field, but at the same time, uh, forum. If you look at the Feminist Charter, it's a space for Nigerian women only. It's one of the few places and spaces that Nigerian women have defined for themselves that it is our space. We may have male allies, we may have male cousins, but we don't have male feminists. Because at the end of the day, it's very hard to give up a privilege that is yours when a culture and a society ensures that you're constantly privileged. It's difficult to give up that. And feminism, its critical role is to ensure that the structures that create patriarchy are slowly dismantled. Beyond Rosa Luxembourg, another person that really uh, endeared me to uh, the African Feminist Forum uh, is uh, uh, B.C. Fayemi that I met in New York uh, with other uh, women, with other feminists, you know, in, uh, when we went for one of the CSWU uh, meetings. And since then, I was able to participate in the African Feminist Forum, and I've also been an active member of the Nigerian Feminist Forum. Uh, also at the level of uh, broader engagement, we also started off what we call the Feminist Women Manifesto, which also helps in terms of uh, strengthening our conversation with respect to the demands and charter that feminist women, you know, have, you know, on the government, on how to hold government accountable, you know, in Nigeria. And with that, I think we have achieved a lot in terms of engaging, you know, the government of Nigeria in, in terms of pushing for feminist principles, uh, feminist ethics, you know, uh, that has also been shaping, you know, the, uh, the, the way uh, feminism is uh, being received, you know, in a country, you know, like uh, Nigeria. For me, when we do a theoretical study of feminism, we tend to focus on the feminist, the history of the feminist, and tell the story of the feminists in Europe. Oh, it's how it was in UK, how it was in US, and the India, we come in and say feminism in India. But we got formidable feminists. They were not called feminists from Africa, from Nigeria, from our own sociocultural enclave. And that for me is what I would term the history of our own feminism. My maternal grandmother was born amongst other boys. She was the only girl in her family. And she inherited a piece of land from her father. Her father gave it to her before he died. And at the point of death, emphasized that it belonged to her. There were other larger parcels of land for the brothers. At the death of the father, the brothers took it over with the excuse that as a girl child, as a woman, she didn't need to inherit that parcel of land from her father. She took it to what I'll call the Agole, the family group. Oh, and they said the brothers were right. She took it to the Bale, that's the local Bale. And they, they said the brothers were right. My grandmother took it as far as the divisional high court then. That was before I was born. It was three days walk from my village to Ibadan. They call it to Kediu, Ibadan. Three days. There, there were no vehicles then, they would walk for three days. It took her a whole five years 
to get justice. She finally got justice. So in her lineage, there is a parcel of land that will only be passed on to her female genitals and could be used by her female progenitors. It was not she had other properties. For, that particular one was not available for her male lineage. They could not touch it or use it. That for me is what I mean by feminists who had blazed the trail. I imagine myself walking two and four, three days two, three days four, for five years and not giving up with all the intimidations, all the social cultural restrictions. And then I will know, like they will say in our local dialect, in Nigerian English, I carry in Yashua. That is why I said we had feminists before the nomenclature feminism came. People who, who went against the grain. This was a woman who had worked with her husband to the cocoa business, the farm, and it worked. They finally had enough money to build a house. The day they moved into the house, the husband brought in a new wife. She was seven months pregnant. She moved, she moved out. She started all over again. And she ended her life being richer than her husband. I never got to know my grandfather until I was in Form 3. Those are feminists. You talk about the ransom putties. You talk about feminists who had walked the shores of this land who had done things that were not considered normal by the patriarchal society, who had been maligned and blacklisted. And we need to tell their stories. Those for me are the feminists that we should be celebrating. Well, there were so many, um, you know, it depends on how far back we want to go. But um, I, I do think that it's really, uh, you know, essential and hard feminist um, or feminism as, as a noun, as a thing, you know, that was conceptualized in the turn of the 20th century. Um, and that has its, its place and its purpose. Um, so there's women like Queen uh, Nzinga, um, you have even uh, Queen Makeda of Ethiopia and Amina of Zazao in, in Northern Nigeria, so you can go far back, and then also you know there's the the, the kind of uh, the, the pre-colonial um, and post-colonial because they 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 continue. And like who was I thinking of Fumilayo and Ikulapo Kuti, of course, um, Flora Mwapa, many of these writers who who were working at the time who may not necessarily have called themselves feminists, but you know they certainly were contributing to the feminist movement. So, I find the history of feminism in Nigeria a bit checkered. Well, maybe not checkered is not the word, but with holes still. Um, Nigeria is a country of oral histories, which means not many things were recorded. Um, things were passed on orally from one generation to another, from one family to another, from one movement to another. So I feel like we've lost the voices and the histories of so many feminists in this space. Um, I believe that there are a few who've made it, whom we've managed to document their histories. Um, there are a few of the famous ones, um, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti, um, Queen Amina of Zazel, people like Margaret Ekpo, but there are also the ones that are not often spoken about. Um, the Bibi Bakaris of this world, the Dorothy Akenovas, there are many other people who've pushed back on patriarchal values from the beginning of time people who organized and ensured that women had a common voice, that women were able to stand for themselves and try and find ways that, fem um, that patriarchy did not put shackles on them. So um, there's the pre-colonial history of uh, feminism and women's organizing. There is the organizing that happened during the time of Fumilayo and um, Gambo Sawaba and people like that. And then people like Zainab Al-Ghali who carried on very quiet activism by telling their stories, by taking up space, by showing a different way that people could, could stand up for the rights of women without it having a name, whether it was called feminism or women's rights. So I feel like being a culture of written uh, of oral histories instead of written histories means that we've lost the stories and the histories 
of many women who stood in the gaps and whose shoulders we stand on. I remember there were conversations we had at that time when some people were shy about coming out to say they are feminists. They would rather have other nomenclature. Feminism has a place for Nigerian women. Feminism, the Nigerian feminist movement, has provided a voice, an umbrella, a coming to, a move, not only to help others become, but to also ensure that there is justice, there is security, there is fairness for the woman, for the girl child in every sphere of life. It is our reality. It speaks to our reality. For more than ever before, we need to bring in more people so that when we leave the stage, there will be more people who will provide the voice. I am thinking of a situation where we will be able to go to the grassroots and let people who practice this as part of their daily lives, who do not come under the umbrella of feminists, identify as feminists. So for me, I think it speaks to our reality. It is part of our reality. It gives a voice to the voiceless, and we should continue to do that. The first thing is that not all of us are going to be speaking from the same song sheet. So you're going to have different kinds of women. You're going to have those who think feminism is too radical, they don't want to deal with it because it challenges certain norms and values. So they'll rather be called gender activist and deal with the softer issues of um, domestic violence, child defilement, women's access to politics. Those who want to deal in feminism recognize that there are structural issues that need to be theoretically analyzed and addressed. And by dealing and recognizing those structural dynamics, what makes patriarchy so powerful? Why is it that oh, 30 years since 1995, after the Beijing World Conference, we're still in the same place talking about getting women into power, uh, access, this, that, nothing has moved. The gender activists have fought themselves to a standstill. The GEO, Gender Equality Bill, has not been passed. It has been there since 1999. We have serious fundamental challenges ahead. And until we recognize that feminism is one way to go about providing the space to offer alternatives to the way we do things about women's, women's rights, women's protection, with, you know, access to justice. Until we are willing to do that, we will continue to see the disparity. I think Nigerian feminism is coming mainstream. For a long time, it's been a very fringe group. And for a long time, the Nigerian women's movement saw Nigerian feminism as a fringe group. We had issues, like I said, around family values, around reproductive health rights, around sexuality and freedom. And with the current younger crop of feminists who are, I could also like to say, reaping the benefits of feminist activism in Nigeria that came before them, and they have come out demanding more inclusivity for a broader range of uh, definitions of around sexuality and also reproductive health rights and violence against women, which for a long time in our society was seen as a normal thing. Some people even thought that, uh, I've, I've heard it said, I've heard women say that yeah, if, if my husband doesn't beat me, how would I know he loves me? And this was, of course, 20, 30 years ago. So it depends on what audience you're looking at. Who is a Nigerian woman? And I think that's a, also a greater definition. We have a more modern, more educated, um, millennial generation of women whose feminism is much, much different from the feminism of my generation or the feminism that 
uh, was also being defined of, say, the generation before me, the feminists who are currently in their 70s, 80s, some who have also passed away, like I've mentioned already. Nigerian feminism or Nigerian feminists have enriched very, very strongly the conversations around um, women development, uh, gender issues. We have allowed that conversation to be brought to the table, that it's not business as usual, which is, oh, include women, empower women, but we have brought that conversation about questioning the very foundation, structure, systems that continue to, ens to, to enshrine patriarchy in the first place. Uh, a second thing that Nigerian feminism has done is that it has included the voices, um, but not in a tokenistic way. It has really, really brought that dialogue to places of power. So even in our organizations, we are questioning issues of sexual um, oppression. We are questioning issues of sexual harassment. We are not saying, oh, it's a woman, oh, it's a man. So therefore, um, you know, we're even questioning ourselves as feminists, as civil society organizations, are we walking the talk? Are we doing what is right? Um, that wouldn't have been possible without that, you know, that dialogue of even questioning um, the very structures that create those systems in the first place. Now, if you, uh, if you ask a Nigerian woman, regardless of where she's located, regardless of um, the position she occupies or you know, the class she's from. Nigerian women want security. Nigerian security, they want to be safe to farms uh, and, and farm and not be abducted or raped. They want to live their lives free of poverty. Women also need to know that they can give birth without dying in the process. Nigeria has one of the highest rates of maternal uh, mortality in the world, and that is totally unacceptable. And so with all these concerns of uh, Nigerian women, what I have learned over the years is that the feminist movement in Nigeria has responded by looking at five broad areas. And the first is in the area of ensuring that there are increased opportunities for women's economic empowerment and livelihoods. Remember, I started out by talking about women's choices. If women do not have a livelihood, if women have to be totally dependent on all the men in their lives, their fathers, their husbands, their brothers, their sons, for them to be able to um, earn a living, make a living, and you know, uh, have um, you know any you know sense um, of belonging whatsoever, right from local government level to the highest levels possible, women need to be able to have a voice. And one of the areas in which we've done extremely poorly as Nigerian women is having a presence in politics and decision making. We are there in a large numbers as, as part of political machineries to um, push the men into these spaces. But when it comes to women occupying these spaces, we find ourselves in a situation whereby right now women are less than 5% in the National Assembly. We have no women at all who are state governors. We have a handful of women as deputy governors and that number keeps decreasing in each electoral cycle. And we have some states in Nigeria where there are no women at all in the state house of assembly. We cannot continue like this because it means that 50, at least 50% of the population is not considered important enough for their voices to be heard. So the issue of access to political participation and decision making is key. So the key impact I would say is about raising the voice of women in a way that the state, society and family listens. Because if we hadn't had voices raised, no one would have thought of this thing as an issue and recognized. But for me, feminism has created a new space where it is business on to question certain realities to rethink it and to show by example what is possible. Uh, if that has been done, I am aware that working with other feminists, 
we have been able to push the uh, Nigerian government to agree to declare a state of emergency during the last COVID on uh, gender-based violence. I've also worked with other feminists to be able to also negotiate, you know, with patriarchy, you know, to pass law at different places. For example, in um, um, Ubu State, the law uh, responding to violence against persons, which actually specifically talk about violence against women and girls, you know, have been passed. In uh, Bono State, uh, there are also a lot of work going on in that regard. So I've actually worked with other women's group to ensure that we entrench feminist principle in legislative uh, and policies, uh, legislations and policies in Nigeria. So by and large, um, feminists in Nigeria have been able to regroup and they have become stronger in the last period. If you look at the last NSAS, young feminists actually led you know, the uh, NSAS movement and NSAS intervention. Uh, so meaning that if we look at the contribution that feminism has done to this country, uh, it is something that is um, worthy of acknowledging and recognizing. I think we've lost we've lost the the boil and hidden see sexual assault and rape of women and girls and to a lesser degree boys. So we've lost that boil. So now, whilst people still don't want you to talk about it too much recognizing that it's a cultural problem. They're recognizing that we have pedophiles in the community. They're recognizing abuse when they They're questioning authority or people in authority who behave strangely to young girls and they don't like it. Uh, another issue, have a right to a voice and that voice can be in the in the in their access to political participation and decision making, their ability to think, and 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 be see, you know look we have very bright young Nigerian women really, uh, on the appendage of a man or a husband, and finally, I would say that we've always had economic access because that is. Culturally specific, our Yoruba sisters have always been economically independent. Our Igbo sisters, it, in those days, to get married, if you were not bringing to the table some skill, and it wasn't about money, it was about onera hair, what does she do? You know, can she, can she sell her cassava from her farm? All those little things, sell palm oil. So those things, are now wider open, you know, the wider opportunities. Of course, we don't have a lot of women who are engaged in large scale agricultural farming. That would have been ideal, but there are some women engaged in manufacturing. There are some women engaged in um, and businesses like that. It would have been nice to see a wider scale of them as we've seen a wider scale of women accessing and reporting violence, uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence? First, I think um, being able to put together the Nigerian Feminist Forum platform in Nigeria mm -hmm. is huge. I feel that it's a huge achievement because while other African countries have tried, we have suffered a lot of challenges. And for it to even exist till today, I think it's a huge achievement because it, it shows that, yes, there is a platform for those who know to be able to engage. We used to have, the Nigerian Feminist Forum used to have training sessions where we used to have the Feminism 101. And that has really assisted a lot of young women, myself being included, because Feminism 101 is where it brings the feminism issue to you, clarify quite a number of things, meet uh, where people talk about feminism is bad, it's not this and that, but it brings the real gist to you. Because what we get these days is just the shafts, like they, they are, everybody's arguing about what feminism is. But when you attend the, the workshop on Feminism 101, it does open your eyes to a lot of things. I also know that NFF engages in a lot of 
advocacy at the national level. So um, NFF engages in a lot of advocacy at the national level, be it on GBV, women issues, women's human rights, um, and sexual reproductive health that we've engaged at that level, either in writing um, different kinds of letters, um, fighting for women to be released, talking about the issue of GBV. Recently last year, which you were at the forefront of it, we were talking about the issue of the VAP across the country and going to different states who have not assented to the VAP to be able to advocate that. This is a high level, um, level kind of advocacy that so many organizations are not taking up. because some of these younger feminists are people that I know and 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 there are many other younger um, feminists um, uh, as, as well in in the farmer men that are doing that doing their own beat um, you take the NSAS movement um, the young sisters that have emerged um, who we didn't even know were there in the first instance and I think these are the people that you're referring to um, mm -hmm. take for instance a Toyo Siakirili as well so there are connections, you know, or or Ichioma Agwego, but but or, or, or Cynthia Mbamalu. So there are connections, but it's it's not enough. It's not strong enough because we, as the older feminists, need to think about the best way to hand the baton to young women who are up, up upcoming and who who want to be supported, who respect standards enough. Those young women need to understand what it is to be a feminist. They need to clarify their values. They need to start understanding that feminism is not about hatred for men. Feminism is not about being abusive or trying to flaunt yourself as this tough woman. In fact, you can be humble, you can be um, as assertive as possible, but not abusive. And if you are not abusive, people will understand your point better. It's about using evidence. It's about making your case in such a way that people will understand you. And we must not miss the point that feminism brings people together whatever your orientation. It brings human beings together and try to value every human being as an individual who has their rights and privileges. And of course they have obligations too, because you cannot have rights and privileges without knowing your own obligations mm -hmm. that you must fulfill. Wow. I think one of the biggest challenges facing feminism in Nigeria today um, is that is a lack of documentation. We do not have documentation that we can pass on to the younger generation of feminists that tells them specifically, look, this is what's been done, this is who did it. So a lot of young feminists seem to come out and think that nothing's been done and that what they've met is how the country was 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years ago, which is not true. And I think one of the biggest caps we have is around documentation and the creating, I won't say of history, but of her story. We need to write that her story. We need to write the history of the Nigerian women's movement, which is very different from the Nigerian feminist movement also. But both histories need to be very strategically uh, documented. I think for me that, that, that pains me a lot. Um, it pains me that I don't feel as if they're doing as much reading as they could and should. I feel as if the instant gratification of seeing me, I've done this, this is what I'm doing, this is the accolade, I've got an award, it. And I don't think they realize that when you say you're doing feminism, it also come with an academic cultural and power dynamics that cause. And by understanding it, it moves beyond advocacy 
which is what a lot of the young e-feminists do very well. We've, until we are constantly analyzing what we want to be able to do the advocacy effectively. So yes, with the young sisters using social media, they're awesome, I love them. I mean, I love them, but I would like to see more engaging academically because I think we, we need the behavioral change and the behavioral change is not just advocacy. The behavioral change is analyzing why these issues are happening. Why is it reoccurring? Since 1995, why? What has happened or not happened? What do we need to do? What are the factors that we need to take on board? And until that happens with our younger sisters, we're going to be going round and round in a circle. Well, um, I think this has been a recurring question that has come up in different fora. Um, and the fact that Nigeria is a large country and people are dispersed in different places has made it more difficult. But I mean, although many of us are tired of Zoom, <laughs> one of the advantages is that it is possible to talk to people who aren't necessarily in your location. Um, and I think the Nigerian Feminist Forum has a role to play here in trying to um, convene um, uh, for um, you know, sessions where people have that opportunity to have conversations. And they could be either on particular themes um, you know, that people are interested in um, or particular incidents. Um, but also, but running through all of this, I think there are certain things that we need to um, sort of have in our, have in the forefront. One is the need to really understand more about our realities, past, present, and what we would like the future to be. And two, and, and these, you know, um, are not entirely separate from one another, I'm just speaking about them separately, um, is to, un to understand more about what is happening. You know, so like, um, what is the problem with, the current, with current economic policy? Why is violence against women and girls such a recurring feature of life? Is it that the situation has changed considerably or that we're hearing more about it. You know, so there are particular themes that keep coming up and I think that there is a need to throw more light on that um, so that we understand more about what, what's at play here, but also just listen to one another more, know more about who is doing what, where, what uh, do we feel we're making um, any progress on, what are the key challenges, how can we support one another better. So I, I think there is scope for that and I think that NFF has definitely has a role to play here. I think mentorship is a role, but I think we need to be careful in how we define mentorship. That Nigerian thing of carry my handbag and kiss my feet, that's not membership. mentorship. Mentorship is loving, it's giving, it's working together, it's encouraging, it's, it's a relationship that blossoms. You watch a person grow to their best ability. That is mentorship. You watch and you encourage and you advise. Sometimes they take your advice and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have to fall down and learn and then pick themselves up and run with it. And if you, ha I mean, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply privileged to have been a mentor to several young women. And I think because I was mentored by three different women, all non-Nigerians, I developed the certain skill sets you need, patience. Because if you don't have patience, 
you can never mentor a Nigerian woman because she comes with baggage. And sometimes the baggage is emotional and clouds her judgment, even when she's in the right direction. The three things that we've always done, you know, ensure that um, we bring vis visibility to the rights of women and the way women feel and their right to have aspirations, engage the state, community and family, and never go away, document our stories. That is what we need to do. Because the power of possibility is a powerful thing that feminism has. No, it was, it was, it was even a done thing for women to aspire for public office. Now we're having female presidents globally. We're having female governors. We're having, you know, um, female deputy governors, you know, ministers, all of that. Traditional institutions are rethinking um, the role of women as well. We're having lead gen at the community level. So doing more of those kind of things where women's leadership is affirmed and respected, it will, it will lead to new things. Giving voice to people whose voices have not been respected we get people to know that, oh, they're also human beings and they matter. And being also mindful of the toxic nature of things that we're jumping with all of our hands and our feet because we need to stay alive to be able to fight the battle. So we must look for strategic allies. We must create safe spaces for all in the movement so that um, if there are people, right, we must not leave them vulnerable to further. And, and so, creating safe spaces where voices can connect has always been my own thing. Where voices connect so that everyone can understand that this is where my people have my back. This is where I need to fight my battle. This is where I need to explain who I am. And, and this, these are the boundaries. This is where you know, I, I can I can put a stop. I think the first thing is to keep talking. These okay. were issues that were not even recognised as issues until feminists started, and women in general, started raising them. So we have to keep talking, we have to keep moving the public discourse to recognise them, not simply as problems, but also as rights, not simply as rights, but also things that have to be implemented in, in women's daily lives. Secondly, I think we have to be talking with, and please note I said with, not to, mm -hmm. women in different situations, so that rural, urban, poor, middle class, rich, with and without formal education, in different languages, across ethnicities, to keep a pulse on the issues that are issues for everybody, but which may manifest in different ways, mm -hmm. or be prioritised in different ways, so that we can mutually raise awareness amongst all our differences and diversities of the issues, possibilities for action in solidarity and sisterhood. Thirdly, I think we need to keep looking for and providing concrete alternatives. So it's not just pie in the sky. We have health groups, clinics, research, support, women's shelters. So I think we need to keep pushing for a comprehensive health system for everybody that integrates support for women's reproductive health and rights into mm -hmm. the provision of the health service. And when I say comprehensive, I also mean accessible. So, and I also think that we need to keep pushing for the elimination or the reform of laws to support women's rights and choices. I think it's really important that as African women, not just Nigerian women, but as African women, we have this healthy, open discussion on bodily integrity. In the last few weeks, we've seen what has happened in Ghana regarding our LGBTQ sisters and their families in Ghana. We've also seen the discussion around women's access to reproductive choices and reproductive choices in its wider sense. Do I want to have children? Yes or no? Do I want to go on family planning? Yes or no? 
should I become pregnant through rape, sexual assault, or accidentally pregnant, the contraceptive has failed? Do I have access to an abortion? Yes or no? These are discussions that we have to have as Africans, as Nigerians, and individually with ourselves. I am a pro-choice mama. I am a Nigerian feminist, and I believe those discussions have to happen. Until we have healthy discussions, some people don't want to have children. They may have been victims of a sexual assault. They may have been victims of incest. They may have been, they may not have been any victim. They just don't want. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean the witch has taken over them. But these are choices that we have to uh, allow individuals to have. And our constant policing of the bodies of African women, Nigerian women, the constant policing, the constant, oh, you know, if you don't do this, uh, you know, and everybody feel it. Look, if anybody wants a child, go and adopt a child or have a child. But I don't think owners should be on individuals to make other healthy discussion. And until we have that healthy discussion, it is going to be a bone of contention. We talk about the issue of safe space. And sometimes we have also been experiences and some level of conversation also wondered if the safe space was really safe. Because mm -hmm. depending on who is in the room, who is within the circle, this, the space can be actually safe. That women can come out and talk about their bodily integrity, um, issues surrounding you know safe and unsafe abortion, access to contraceptives, how do they plan their life, decision about themselves and their bodies, and how do they protect themselves to start with. There's this huge conversation around um, women taking charge of protection when they know that their partners have been in, you know, engaged in all kinds of infidelities. How do you protect yourself when you are aware that your partner is not faithful because you're going to get some form of sexually transmitted infection? The, um, being able to actually speak out to say, I know this is what you're doing and I do not feel safe. How do you take that decision within whom? So at what points do we have a safe enough space to be able to discuss these issues, including the issue of sexual orientation? So, so it's, a, it's a tricky one, really, I would say, because even within the space, sometimes you have found some people who say, yes, I believe in um, feminism as far as it has to do with women's rights. I do not believe in sexual orientation. So that, that has created quite a bit of confusion, uh, thought for some of us who are open to all levels things in the, in the charter and we are able to bring all the issues to, to the table. I think we can discuss more. We can create more safe spaces to ensure that everybody who is within the house is or who is within the circle is open to these conversations and we do not judge because judgment creates core and creates strife and makes people uncomfortable. Um, I feel like feminism does for a lot of young women, especially young Nigerian women, women everywhere. It helps to create a safe space to talk about um, certain events and different things. And it helps others realize that they are not alone. Um, in certain situations, which could be even more helpful than maybe, you know, talking to like a therapist or going to like the authorities or something. It could just be more helpful to know that you're not the only person in a, in a particular situation. And there are also people willing to help you get out of the situation because um, a lot of the times um, people in power and the authorities, they don't really help um, when it comes to problems like coercion and regulation and abuse, like regulation of women's bodies and abuse. Um, but having a, knowing that there's a community who is there who can help you and who is willing to help you as well um, could be really helpful and really reassuring to a lot of young women all over the world. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's something major that feminism does to help and protect women everywhere, so yeah.
Well, um, I think that there are organizations working in this field. TIERS is the one that um, is in the forefront, but there are others too. Um, I think one way would be to, again, you know, convene events or discussion um, for uh, where people can talk about the issues, talk about the work that they're doing, talk about the challenges and like uh, whatever issue uh, groups and individuals may be engaged in, try and work towards a more strategic approach to changing the, car the status quo. So that, and by strategic, I mean having a, a strategy in place, which means having a plan and trying to work out what would be, what would have the greatest impact. And of course that would mean impact on whom, what kind of impact, who's doing what, yeah? All of those things. So I think that that's something that applies across the, that would apply across the board. I think the African Charter on Feminist Principles is very clear on all those three points. Um, without reinventing the wheel, I think it is important that we recognize that they are people that are born in the wrong bodies. And therefore, if they're born in the wrong bodies are transgender sisters and brothers, then there has to be a discussion around them. Our, our, our family members who are LGBTQI did not just become LGBTQI. They were born that way. And I think the way things are where people decide or assume that if their brother or sister is not behaving in the prescribed gender norm, then they are gay without any evidence, likes the art, and they've beaten him because they think he's gay. Meanwhile, the boy hasn't done anything. So I think it's really important that we recognize that, there, that sexuality is fluid. Um, and because it is fluid, doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's fluid. And we need to look at it and interrogate it and recognize it and accept it. The thing, the funny thing is, culturally in Africa, gender has always been fluid anyway. But, you know, I've, and that's one of the reasons why I struggle with religion and the kind of religion we have. We have imported, first it was Victorian Christianity from England, where they thought women were chattel and they treated women as chattel. And you're talking about 18th century Christianity that they brought. Then when they got bored, they brought American evangelism. And those ones are even nuttier than the rest of everybody else. They're completely bananas. And now our culture is infused with values or norms that are not culturally relevant to us. I'm Igbo. We have a dual sexual political system. Uh, if you understand the Igbo cultural norms, it is so so gender neutral, scary, especially for those who are religious not. So e names, we don't have specific, you know, my name is Ihoma, but you will meet somebody from another place who is male who answer that name. We didn't have, you know, if you met an average young Igbo man, he knew how to cook and clean because cooking was not seen specifically for women or men. It was that you had to survive. You are going to be on the farm, farming. You need to cook and you may cook on the farm. When I met my husband, he couldn't cook and clean. All the boys in his family cooked and cleaned. They were villagers. So this norm <clears throat> that we've adopted, that, you know, heteronormative gender alliance, allegiance, you know, your boy, so you have to do this, you wear blue. That's just not applicable to many African cultures. And we're being force fed it. And we're not recognizing that it's antenna to our communities. It's causing a big, big problem. As for the role of sex workers, we've always had sex workers. I don't understand what the problem is. Um, I think everybody's entitled to humanity, LGBTQI, transgender and sex workers. We need to do better. I think it is, the funny thing is that we all know somebody that's sleeping with a sex worker. And we all know women that poverty has created or have made a sex worker. You know it's a career, right? You know it's work. The only thing is that the government's not taxing them. In other parts of the world, they tax them because it is work. 
So once we've distinguished between those the trafficking of sex workers and we've understood the dynamics, I think we really need to think carefully how we protect our sex workers, how we protect our minorities in its wider sense. Because allowing uh, human rights abuses to occur and violence to occur because we think they have no right or we don't like what they're doing. Uh, and that's very dangerous, very, very dangerous because you open the floodgates. You know, people are mad already as it is. Nigeria is a hard place. You talk too much, they put tie on your neck and they light a match. So we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. The answer is still the same thing as nothing about us without us. It is about inclusion. It is about understanding that one human being is made up of multiple identities. It is about understanding other people's context and even coming from a place of tolerance. It's about coming from a place of being open-minded enough to seek to understand. Is it not what research is supposed to be? Seeking to understand further. So when we research with a closed mind and they say, um, uh, every researcher must declare their bias early before the research starts. It means that, you know, even though you have a bias, you declare your bias and you're willing and open for new information. So I said nothing about us without us, meaning that LB, LGBT people, trans women, trans folks, gender non-conforming women, sex workers, everybody should be brought to the table. We're not coming there to come and, and uh, it is a political space here, yeah? but however, we're coming to a place where we are bringing our diversity and we are forming a collective. Again, I think that many of the things that I've just said in terms of women's reproductive rights are things that are, are first of all, strategies, but also issues that are also applicable to people who are sex workers or LGBTQI and transgender. Secondly, I think it's really, really important to discuss with those communities, some of whom are feminists as well, of course. The communities are not you know, separate, they're often overlapping, about how to go about it and how to prioritize these, those issues rather than to speak in their name.